Welcome to my presentation, where I will be showing some examples of embedded and microfluidic-based sensors. This presentation uh, is prepared with the contributions of my colleagues, Dr. Bell, Dr. Ruark, and Dr. Schneider, and presents work that has been done in BAM, the Federal Institute for Material Research and Testing in Berlin, Germany. Sensors are the scientific and technological extension of human senses and enormously expand human capabilities. Despite the fact that uh, scientific and technological advances are usually seen in positive light, the name of this conference, Sensors for Good, put me in a bit of a trouble, because in general science does not operate in ethical categories, but instead it just tells how far from the truth one is. In this respect, sensors help us in recognizing states and events beyond our immediate reach. Fortunately, sensors are used for many applications, such as environmental monitoring, food control, health, and the like, which unequivocally benefit society. I will focus on a particular type of sensors, those that rely on microfluidics for operation and which are typically realized in lab on chip devices. In this domain, where at least one of the dimensions through which a fluid flows is submillimetric, our natural senses fail, because the phenomena are too small to be detected either by eye, smell, touch, and even the common sense explanation that we learned for many years in school is not applicable, because the phenomena are dominated by uh, different parameters. To give one simple example, which uh, I illustrate with a graph on the right side of the slide, in general, the direction of the flow in microfluidic channel does not depend on the up-down direction of the channel because gravitational force or the weight of the fluid is negligible compared to the viscous forces or capillary forces uh, that are present in the chip. This presentation consists of three parts. Initially, two sensors produced in our lab are presented, followed by a simulation-oriented discussion on microfluidics and biosensors, and finally, a project in progress that we are involved in is presented, concluding with a list of open issues raised during the presentation. The first example of a sensor produced in BAM is a microfluidic electrochemical immunosensor for the trace analysis of cocaine in water and body fluids, namely saliva and urine. The device is an embedded microfluidic platform coupled to a modular tubing system and a screen-printed electrode. The sensor uses anti-cocaine antibodies grafted on magnetic beads, the motion of which is then controlled through an external permanent magnetic field. Uh, in our experiments, a symbol uh, uh, fridge magnet is used. An electrical signal is produced in the redox reaction of uh, catechol by way of an enzyme tracer competing with the analyte cocaine for the antibody and is recorded using a three electrode system the typical reference electrode, working electrode, and the counter electrodes. The cyclic uh, voltammetric measurements gives uh, current versus potential curves, which are then converted to peak partial currents, anodic and cathodic uh, currents, as a function of concentration. And these are given in the slides on the right side. When the immunosensor was tested with spikes, with spiked cocaine in complex matrices, the recovery from the immunosensor showed excellent sensitivity and range, as can be seen in the table below. Figure on the left shows the electrode before the introduction of the magnetic beads with the antibody, then with the captured magnetic beads, and finally after they are partially washed from the electrode. The red arrows point to the immobilization center where the beads are captured. I encourage the, the interested viewers to have a look at the paper listed below uh, for further details. The second example of a sensor produced in BAM is a fluorescent test strip with a smartphone readout for the detection of adulterated gasoline. Uh, I guess a practical device like this would be welcomed in Kosovo, where the complaints on the quality of fuel have been going on for quite a long time. More uh, precisely about the principle of work of the device, the concentrations of gasoline and 
kerosene or alcohol mixtures are investigated using fluorescence. The system is based on the dependence of the fluorescence of a solvatochromic dye, which is a fluorescent reporter for polarity. As kerosene is less polar liquid than gasoline and alcohol a more polar liquid, their mixture in various proportions will have different polarity, which is recorded. The measurement is done on paper strips uh, chemically impregnated with the dye, which then are dipped in the adulterated uh, sample mixture. The shift of the fluorescence is then recorded with a smartphone for which a customized app was designed in BAM. The results show the relationship between gasoline content and fluorescence emission wavelength, color. This color can be converted into hue values in degrees. The outcome is that kerosene and alcohol content in gasoline uh, can be detected in concentrations above 5% and 0.5% uh, respectively. This measurement can be done uh, rapidly and reliably. Again, the interested uh, viewers are invited to have a look at the papers for uh, details. Central to the discussion of the presented sensors, but also to the biosensors in general, are the principles of microfluidics, because based on these, one can design a chip that has a chance of being functional. The description of motion in these kind of devices is much simpler than say, the motion of fluids in large scale, and this is so for two main reasons. Microfluidic flows are laminar, and the dominant mixing mechanism is diffusion, as contrasted to turbulent and convective flows. Consequently, equations of motion for fluids in the microfluidic scales are simpler. Nevertheless, analytical solutions exist only for very limited types of microfluidic flows, and in the majority of cases, one must make use of numerical computational solutions. One of these cases that can be described by a closed form expression is the so-called Poiseuil flow in the channel of an elliptical cross section. The solutions for velocity profile in channels with different ratios of the axis and different pressure gradients are quite straightforward and show a symmetry as expected. The problem becomes more complicated when one considers channels with rectangular cross-sections, which is the overwhelming case for microchannels in practice. Here, the velocity profile is not given by a closed form expression, but by an infinite series. Nevertheless, it can be calculated with an excellent accuracy for most practical uh, cases. This figure shows the profiles of velocity components for channels of rectangular shape with width to height ratio of 4 to 1. Another example of interest is the appearance of the so-called Taylor dispersion, which is an example of the combined convection and diffusion. The interest in this uh, phenomenon stems from the need to enhance the mi mixing by inserting uh, one fluid into the stream of the second, thus achieving a boundary between the fluids perpendicular to the direction of the fluid. This will result in a significant mixing enhancement due to convention, as uh, opposed to mixing by diffusion only, which happens if the flow is strictly laminar and parallel. These graphs show the dispersion of the ethanol in water for two flow cases. With time, ethanol concentration decreases and progresses along the flow direction, with the flow on the right uh, being 10 times faster than, the, than that on the left side. In addition to these simple treatments, one can numerically simulate uh, microfluidic flows for other quite complicated geometries and uh, flow conditions. Uh, it must be noted that the presented calculations were done using the new Octave software for numerical calculations. One limiting factor in designing microfluidic devices is whether the device can actually be fabricated and if this would be affordable. To date, the cheapest sensors are based on paper, as given in the second example, while the first example used the chip from PDMS. 
which is the most common material for microfluidics applications. The discovery of PDMS gave a great push to the field because it provides a cheap material with excellent properties. So it is transparent, it's soft, it's elastic. It can be fabricated easily with channels even down to a micrometer. Nevertheless, a microfluidic chip made uh, of PDMS is a two-step process. Initially, a mold in a silicon wafer is made using lithography, and on this master, the polymer is cast. This process requires clean room conditions and yet cannot be achieved with uh, alternative technologies such as uh, direct 3D printing. For a number of biosensors, reactions that take place are simple enough that they can be modeled. Hence, the performance of a sensor can be predicted. A most successful example is the simulation of the glucometer, the necessary device for people with diabetes. In the simplest case, a biosensor follows the scheme of concentrations. So enzyme plus substrate gives enzyme substrate complex, which then ends up being the uh, enzyme uh, and, uh, plus product. The change of concentrations with time is given by the system of partial differential equations and the output current, which uh, is recorded by the transducer, is given as the product of uh, certain uh, constants, like the number of electrons produced in the chemical reaction, the diffusion coefficient, the Faraday uh, number, and the product of concentration on the surface of the transducer. The numerical solutions of these equations uh, allow for the determination of the enzyme layer thickness, substrate concentration, and reveals the, uh, the expected current density. Here, for example, it is shown the current, de uh, current density expected as a function of the enzyme layer thickness and time, which makes it possible to develop the experimental design space where the optimal conditions are found. In the, this particular case, the optimal experimental condition is noted with the red dot. Unfortunately, these schemes can be developed only for a limited number of simple chemical reactions in biosensors and are yet to be developed for the biosensors presented here. Among biosensors, as devices that produce a physico-chemical signal upon detection of a biological analyte, immunosensors are the most effective ones because they have fast recognition uh, times and high specificity for the analyte. But the modeling of chemical reactions in an immunosensor is not straightforward, and for many situations it remains an open question. This brings me to the final part where uh, I will briefly present an ongoing project in our lab. The project aims to produce a modular, multiplexed, antibody-based lab-on-a-chip analyzer for food control, MAMALOCA for short. And the target analytes are mycotoxins. Mycotoxins can be found in grains of cereals on which certain types of molds grow. There are a number of mycotoxins and their presence in food, especially cereals, as well as in animal feed, is regulated by law. The standard analytical method for their determination is high-performance liquid chromatography, but this is an expensive and laboratory-based method that requires specialist knowledge by the operator. On the other hand, with MAMALOCA, we aim to produce a rapid diagnostic testing device to be operated on the mills, at the point where the grains are being ground into flour. It is our intention to produce a device that the mill operator can use without the need for additional training and certification, and that produces results costing less than 20 euros per test. Similarly to the IMUNA assays for cocaine detection, here also a magnetic bead will be decorated with antibodies for mycotoxins, namely oratoxin, uh, deoxinylvalenol, uh, zeralenone, and ergot alkaloids. At the moment, we are working in two ways of detecting the signal, through electrochemical and optical transduction. So, in conclusion to this presentation, I restate once more the most important issues 
with regards to the use of lab on chip biosensors, now having a more critical outlook. First point I'd like to raise is whether we are dealing with labs on the chip or chips in the lab. There is a large number of labs on the chip prototypes designed and tested in laboratory conditions, but only a few have made it to the market. Uh, glucometer and pregnancy tests are shining examples. One of the reasons why we are stuck with uh, chips in the lab is that most of the developments in the fields were solutions to scientific and engineering problems, as opposed to the needs of the industry. The second point to raise is lack of standardization. This can serve as an opportunity, especially for the open source community, because it allows for exploration and development. But it is also an obstacle for the expansion in scale of these devices. Of note, for example, is the need for standards on how a device integrates and communicates with peripherals, with uh, external equipment, or the production of microfluidic chips into a large, into a mass production scale. The third point that uh, I would like to raise is the uh, getting out of the clean room. Science of labs on a chip based by sensors is well understood and a lot of designs already exist. Nevertheless, there is always room for further improvements. One among many needed improvements is the development of tools for production of microfluidic chips outside a clean room environment. Not to mention other problems, mathematical problems related to the field where one can model different designs and has a lot of equations to solve in order to achieve the optimum uh, design for a device. Hopefully, by presenting two completed and one project in progress, I was able to show the interest in developing microfluidic-based sensors for diverse applications, and also to show that there is a room for involvement even for the mathematically inclined uh, people. At the end, I would like to express my thanks, first of all, to the uh, organizers of the conference that made it happen, and then to you for your attention and your patience. Thank you. And also to show that there is a room for involvement, even for the... We're having problems... Uh... Because, uh, uh, is, uh, so, uh, at this moment, I think pretty good. It's unfortunate that uh, um, it, was, it was, I think, one of the most dedicated speakers and most excited speakers about uh, Actually, the science is obviously. wondering uh, how uh, the open source community can help with with the scientists so how can they work with you and your your peers to to bring these uh, uh, are the animal type still with us No, I don't see the Okay, it's finally typing. It's saying that there is an interaction between open um, 
Uh, what I meant was that uh, perhaps building the sensors where there is already a, um, yeah. Right, so we're already using software that has been done otherwise, and uh, there's also um, a tradition of the academic uh, publishing stuff in the that this clearly. I was wondering if um, hardware geeks perhaps can do, can do something for you where you do the science and they print the, the Okay, so there's a GitHub page for the Institute. So, work, parts produced can be done only lab standards. Clear. Uh, well, this is a uh, uh, unfortunate local. We thank uh, Ardian for the presentation.